If it's Wednesday, President Biden wraps up his historic wartime trip to Eastern Europe, meeting with NATO allies amid renewed concerns of a Russia-China alliance and renewed nuclear saber rattling inside the Kremlin. Plus, increased scrutiny on the toxic train derailment in Ohio as federal investigators prepare to release their initial findings following a campaign stop from former President Donald Trump that shut down the area's schools today. And in today's trail mix, another potential Republican presidential hopeful, Barnstorms, Iowa. Trump and DeSantis try to carve out lanes with primary voters. And a key Democrat announces he's running for re-election. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from Washington. Right now, President Biden is headed back to Washington from Poland, where he commemorated the upcoming first anniversary of the start of the war in Ukraine, a trip that included a defiant demonstration of Western support in Kyiv on Monday, a guarantee against Russian victory from Warsaw on Tuesday, and a meeting with frontline members of NATO's defense against Russia today. Also happening right now, the U.N. General Assembly is meeting ahead of a vote on a resolution calling for a, quote, comprehensive just and lasting peace in Ukraine. That vote is not expected until tomorrow. And all of that comes as that war enters its second year, with the U.S. and our allies facing renewed concerns of an expanding conflict. Because as President Biden was meeting with allies in Eastern Europe, Vladimir Putin was meeting with Beijing's top diplomat, Wang Yi, who, according to Reuters, pledged that China is ready to deepen its strategic partnership with Russia. This, after Secretary of State Tony Blinken told me on Sunday that U.S. officials are concerned China may provide lethal military aid to Russia to help boost its struggling military operation in Ukraine. Is it weapons? Is it uniforms? What it is is unclear. Meanwhile, Russian officials are once again escalating their rhetoric around nuclear weapons as a top Putin ally defended the regime's decision to suspend its participation in the last remaining nuclear arms treaty in the world with the United States, saying that if the United States wants to defeat Russia, then we have the right to defend ourselves with any weapons, including nuclear weapons. Earlier today, before his meeting with those Eastern European NATO members, President Biden condemned Russia's move to pull out of the nuclear START treaty. Folks, the trajectory of these past few days and the last year has put us on a road towards more conflict, it appears, with Russia and now also China. What's unclear is what will de-escalate these tensions. Putin faces a potential existential threat to his rule if he loses to Ukraine. China appears willing to prop up the Kremlin's efforts for some reason, and the U.S. and NATO have pledged they will stand behind Ukraine to the very end. Here's what NATO Secretary General Jans Stoltenberg had to say this morning as the alliance met with President Biden. We don't know when uh, the war will end, but when it does, we need to ensure that history does not repeat itself. We have seen the Russian pattern uh, of aggression over many years. Georgia in 2008, Crimea and Donbas in 2014, and then the full-fledged invasion of Ukraine last year. We cannot allow Russia to continue to chip away at European security. We must break the cycle of Russian aggression. Well, joining me now from Warsaw, my colleague Kristen Walker, who's been covering the president's trip. And Kristen, what's interesting is the president met with basically the eastern flank of the NATO alliance, uh, those countries that border Russia and or Ukraine. The eastern alliance has, been a, has, wanted, has wanted to be a more aggressive, more helpful to Ukraine than arguably the western flank of the NATO alliance. Um, what was the theme of today's meeting and what was President Biden hoping to get out of it? Well, Chuck, you hit on it. The geography is so important. The fact that this is personal for them. Russia's aggression toward Ukraine is perceived to be a threat by them as well. And so they are increasingly concerned about this war now entering its second year. Could this impact their own sovereign territory? Today, President Biden with a firm message that the United States will stand with NATO, will protect NATO no matter what, really trying to bolster that alliance and making it clear that the U.S. 
is not backing down. For these allies, Chuck, it is critical and it is personal. And so that really was the focus. Even as President Biden tries to keep global allies on board with supporting Ukraine and a divided Congress and American public back at home. What else was on their agenda uh, today? Was immigration issues on the agenda? A lot of them have taken in Ukrainian refugees, uh, arms to Ukraine. Are they comfortable? Get These are the countries that have been giving the Soviet era weapons because um, they also had them in stockpile. Absolutely. First, to your point about refugees. I mean, we are here in Poland, Chuck, a, a country which has taken in arguably more refugees than any other country, more than 1.5 million. And so resources are strained here in Poland in those other countries and leaders with whom President Biden was meeting today. So that was a key focus. And then the question of weaponry. You have, of course, the United States and other European allies stepping up how much weaponry they've been giving to Ukraine. But President Zelensky, including when he stood shoulder to shoulder and met with President Biden earlier this week, said he needs more, including F-16 fighter jets. Right now, the U.S. not prepared to provide that. But look, right. the other thing that was on the agenda is where you started this conversation. The fact that President Putin announced that he is suspending uh, his partnership in that new start treaty and participation in that new start treaty. And I've been talking to administration officials who say, look, while they were not altogether surprised by this because yeah. Russia has not been in compliance with the treaty for quite some time, it is still perceived to be an escalation. Now, they point out and caution that this could have been worse. You could have had Putin pulling out altogether. But this is a step in the wrong direction, Chuck. And the right. question remains, how does this all end? No one has an answer. And what about this issue of China providing lethal aid to Russia any more from the administration on what aid they're concerned about, what kind of, uh, whether they're having any success at, at uh, having China hold off on doing this? Well, the Secretary of State told you, Chuck, of course, this past Sunday that he had issued a stern warning to his Chinese counterpart that there would be serious consequences if China did, in fact, move forward with providing Russia with lethal aid. We've been talking to administration officials to get their sense of where China stands on this. They don't have an update from where that conversation started between you and the Secretary of State on Sunday, Chuck, but I can tell you they say this is a top concern, particularly given that he was in mm -hmm. Russia meeting with Putin today. And of course, Putin saying during that meeting that he now expects China's president to come to Moscow. That being met with a lot of skepticism by U.S. officials who are concerned that right. China will only intensify this conflict and make it worse. Chuck. Kristen Welker in Warsaw tonight for us. Kristen, thank you. So let's dig deeper into what's going on in Moscow, or at least the best we can. Joining me now, two people who have a pretty good sense. Michael McFaul, the former U.S. ambassador to Russia and NBC News international analyst, and Gary Kasparov, the chairman of the Renewed Democracy Initiative, a longtime critic of this current Russian regime. Uh, Mike, let me start with you and the um, and China and uh, Russia and this alliance. Obviously, we're concerned about it. What should how seriously do you take China's threat, I guess, to provide lethal aid to Russia? Well, they haven't threatened that, Chuck. That's a very interesting thing. They say they're not doing that, um, and they've, they've st stayed to that. And up until just this weekend, I've been impressed by what they haven't done, right? Mm -hmm. They haven't provided these technologies. They haven't provided military assistance. And when Xi Jinping sat down with Putin the last time they met in Samarkand, uh, Putin went out of his way to say, yeah, Taiwan is yours. Yes, yes, yes. That's your territorial integrity, sovereignty. And she did not return the favor in the way that he talked about it. However, when the vice president at the Munich Security Conference, Gary and I were both there, by the way, when she went out of her way to put that marker down mm -hmm. and then Blinken did it the day after, that suggests to me that they're seeing something in the intelligence, mm -hmm. that something's happening that they're trying to hide, and they chose to try to embarrass the Chinese about it. I don't know what it is, but you don't put the things like that in the vice president's speech unless you have hard evidence to suggest that they're about to do this. Well, it's interesting you put it that way, Mike, because that's what it looked like to me. It was sort of like, I don't know whether how true it is or not, make them deny it. It seemed that they wanted to put the pressure on the Chinese. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's what they're doing. Um, 
a bad time for Wang Yi to show up in Moscow, by the way, if you're trying to say you're on the sidelines here. that mm -hmm. I don't know if that timing was planned. But I want to be clear. We don't really know what the U.S. government knows about military assistance. And so far, Beijing has not uh, publicly said that they're doing it, right? My guess is they were trying to do it quietly, and we found out, and now we've called their bluff, we've called them on it, right. and they're trying to decide what to do now. Gary, um, we're a year into this war, and I, I know you certainly were thought that Putin couldn't, uh, that his eyes were bigger than his stomach, but here we are a year in. Um, how does, what does the West need to do to get what Joe Biden calls a strategic defeat for Russia. And then I want to ask you about that phrase after that. But what was it, what is it going to take to actually get to that goal? Weapons to Ukraine. More weapons to Ukraine for Ukrainians to win the war. Uh, this strategic defeat of Russia, it's, um, it's Ukrainian victory that will include full liberation of Ukrainian territory. Um, uh, compensation, reparations, mm -hmm. and also um, uh, international tribunal for war crimes and genocide. Uh, whether President Biden meant that, I am not sure, but uh, it's very clear to me that as long as Putin is in control, the war will not stop. Do you, um, do you believe the West is speaking with clear enough objectives? It's getting better, but we are not yet there. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a long road from Ukraine should lose, Russia should win, to almost saying Ukraine must win. Though it's not exactly must, it's more like, you know, you have to shoot win. <laughs> so well, President Biden's uh, trip to Kyiv was, was a, big, a big milestone. Yeah. It's um, an amazing move, very bold move for U.S. President to land in Kyiv. And uh, combining this, this historic trip with his speech in Warsaw, I think it's a clear message that America is almost ready to go as far as it takes for Ukraine to win. And uh, I think Putin also understands it because his speech was so weak and, and pathetic. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wouldn't even worry too much about the Chinese um, moves now behind the scene, because I believe China cares about Taiwan. What I think they're trying to do is just send a message to America. You mentioned opportunity. Yeah. That's probably, you know, let's, let's, let's make a deal. We, we care about Taiwan, you care about Ukraine. So we don't care very much about Putin because they always saw Putin as, as, as a junior partner in these relations, right. a subordinate to China. So that's why, again, all this big noise, I think it's about Chinese trying to, to get a better bargaining position with America and Europe. Mike, I want to go back to President Biden's trip to Kiev because I think, you know, we're, we're I, you know, I don't know why, but it isn't registering here in America his support. He, it, he's having a hard time selling this politically, and he really hasn't. I, you know, it, it's not American lives haven't been lost. You know, this is one of those things where you normally would think, boy, he's conducting this the way the American public has said they want our foreign expeditions conducted. And he's getting not only zero credit, in some ways it's a net negative. Yeah, it's striking, Chuck. It's disappointing to me uh, because I think he has played it um, in a very precise way to give the Ukrainian support, but not have our soldiers there. I'm with Gary, by the way. I think if you want victory, we have to do more. Uh, we're not giving them the weapons they need for this counteroffensive that they're planning in the spring. And I think time's going to run out. Mm. Uh, politically, time is going to run out. Um, uh, uh, I'll try to talk over that music. No, I think it's the music from 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 uh, Biden. Oh, that's Biden. Yeah, that's okay. Biden's music. You're right. We're, that was odd. It's just the Nat but... sound. I know. Well, that was his walkout music. I know it I was know. odd at the time. <laughs> it's kind of odd, but 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 I think it's striking to me that they don't see the 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 essence of time in the same way I do, and I see it that on military yeah. on the ground, but also for Biden's own reelection prospects. Uh, now is the time for breakthrough. Because right. if there's not a breakthrough, Chuck, you're the political expert here in America, not me. But if this is just yeah. grinding on as we roll into the presidential election next year, yeah. that's not a good look for Biden. No, there, there, there's not going to be domestic political support for this if we're in a, a third year of a stalemate. Gary, I'm curious about something that the, the New York Times did a piece over the weekend that indicated that, believe it or not, one year in, it looks like Putin is more popular or has a more of a stranglehold on the population. Do you concur with that? Nobody knows. 
uh, because uh, the polls in Russia, they are conducted, you know, by the traditional methods, but people are not responding. I can bet you that nine out of 10 of those being asked simply don't answer the question. On the surface, yes, he looks very popular. Okay, Hitler was very popular in 1944 in Germany, so mm -hmm. who cares? I don't think we should we should apply the same methods, the same uh, measures that are being used to 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 understand the level of support. You just uh, put on, on the screen: 41 percent of Americans uh, ha approve um, um, President Biden handling the war in Ukraine. I don't think that we can use the same metrics in mm -hmm. in, in Russia or in any dictatorship. Um, so what we know is that uh, Putin controls this information bubble, and unfortunately, um, the what Russian public sees. It's that uh, Russia is not losing. No matter what American generals or European politicians right. saying, Russia hasn't lost the war because people don't believe they're losing the war. That's why we need Ukrainian success. The moment Ukrainians penetrate in Crimean Peninsula, the moment Russian public understands the war is being lost, uh, then you will see Putin's so house of cards Cri crumbling. What you're saying is Crimea is the, the... It's funny, Crimea is considered Putin's red line. You think Crimea is the public's red line. It's, it's both, actually. Yeah. It's Putin's red line for a simple reason. Crimea is a staple of Putin mythology. Dictatorships like Putin's do not survive when, when, yeah. when this, this mythology is being blown, uh, blown away. And Ukraine, Ukrainian uh, um, um, liberation of Crimea will be the end of Putin's regime. Michael McFaul, Gary Kasparov. I always am smarter about these topics when I have the two of you on. Thank you both for your perspective. Still ahead, the latest on the toxic train derailment in Ohio including today's campaign stop from former President Trump and tomorrow's visit from Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Plus, Republican Senator Tim Scott, a potential presidential candidate, heads to Iowa to deliver a message about the future of the Republican Party in his view. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. While the Biden administration faces the prospect of an expanded conflict involving Russia and China, former Bush administration officials are looking back at the evolution of U.S. relations with both of those adversaries. Stephen Hadley was President George W. Bush's national security advisor. He's got this terrific new book. I'm going to call it a reference book that looks at how foreign policy transitions from one administration to the next, how it works, and the mentions that the Bush administration may have failed to anticipate when it comes to the possibility of a Russia-China strategic alignment. So joining me on set is Stephen Hadley. The book is called Hand Off, the Foreign Policy George W. Bush Passed to Barack Obama. And again, I think, it, and let's, I want to talk about Russia and China first, but it's basically a reference book of, your, of the Bush administration's foreign policy and everything they left, every memo is sort of like, here you go, to... Susan Rice and her team. I think she was the first national security advisor. No, she was Jim second. Jones. No, Jim Jones, that's right, and his team. This was the material you handed off to them, right? Exactly right. The memos basically said, here's what we found, here was our strategy, mm -hmm. here's what we did, and here's what's left to be done, and here are the things that might bite you mm -hmm. to the new administration where they came in. We then updated those. The people who wrote the memos 14 years later came yeah. back, updated them, and yeah. said, what's happened since? What does it say about how we did and how the country has been doing in handling these issues? I, and this is the part I found fascinating because, again, it's just sort of, it's a very, it's what you hope uh, government officials, people like yourself, do with our tax dollars, frankly. It's just, it, it's, a, it's a good, transparent way of thinking. So let's talk about lessons learned with the two topics we're on, Russia and China. So let's start with China. You guys left office, Hu Jintao was there, and, and she was the vice premier that most people expected to be the heir apparent. Um, what did the administration think of him then, and, and, and what's the look-back memo on that one? One of the things, if you look at that memo in the book, it's striking how different the China President Bush faced is from the China we see today. Totally different. The China then was looking for a benign international environment so they could focus on their own domestic renewal and construction of, a, of their society. And it was a China that wanted to be part of the international system rather than overturning it mm -hmm. and wanted a constructive relationship with the United States. So what we tried to do to say, all right, let's see if we can bring China into the international system so they will support it and be part of it. Uh, but at the same time, let's hedge our bets. Mm -hmm. So we tried to strengthen our, al mm -hmm. our relations with our local allies, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. We, of course 
created a strategic relationship with India, which is now more and more important given China's behavior. And we strengthened our own diplomatic, economic, trade, and military position in the region to create a context which would give incentive for China yeah. to come our way but also give a platform in the event China decided not to. And that, of course, is the platform that the Biden administration is using now mm -hmm. with AUKUS and all these other, and the Quad and all the other devices to try to manage this more aggressive and hegemonic China that we face today. What do you think we missed on Xi? When I say we, the collective American intelligence community on him. It's hard to know. You know, you never know what a person is going to be as a president until they actually become president. Mm -hmm. But we clearly misread him. We uh, thought the dominant opinion was that he was going to be an economic reformer and might also be a political reformer. I recall a minority view at the time that, mm -hmm. wait a minute, this is a party man first and last. And he is going to use the party to strengthen uh, political control and to strengthen China. And that's turned out to be who he was. In addition, he's much more of an ideologue than we thought, mm -hmm. much more a, a, quite frankly, a Marxist than we right. anticipated at the time. He's in some sense a throwback, and it shows you who runs a country matters, because he really took the country in a very different direction than John Zeman or, or Hu Jintao was taking the country, his two predecessors. And now I have to say that visual moment we got about three months ago when uh, at, the at, the, at the Chinese Communist Party meeting where they escorted Hu Jintao out of, out of the building. I mean, in some ways, it, it's, it's, it's more striking knowing this now. There was also always about four different factions that were balanced in the mm -hmm. standing committee of the Politburo. And what she did basically over the last several years was break the back of each of those alternatives so that everybody who's now in the standing committee of the Politburo is from the Xi faction and is a Xi man. All right. When you guys left office, it was a guy named Dmitry Medvedev. And what I, what's interesting here is what you just described about Xi, that he's a party man. The same thing is going through my head with Medvedev, because as president, he made it seem as if he was going to be, he was the reformer, he was the guy you could deal with, Putin's my crazy uncle over here, I'm keeping him in control. And now, he look, certainly looks like a party man, as he's the one doing all the saber rattling. You know, Medvedev, uh, under the, the period of the Obama administration, when he was president, uh, made a couple of mistakes in terms of his own standing within the Russian people. Uh, he went along with the Libya operation mm -hmm. by the Europeans, which did not go the way Russia wanted. And I think uh, he ended up damaged and I think was quite stunned when rather than being able to run for re-election... And get a second term as Putin president, basically said no. Putin basically said, I'm back as president, you can, you can work for me. So you think that so, was a moment of shame for him? I do, and I think he's now not going to make that mistake again. He's never going to let anybody get to the right of him on these very issues. And I think that's one of the reasons why, as your prior guest yeah. said, he has now become the mouthpiece for those who say, don't forget the nuclear capability, and if we're, if we're threatened, we'll use it. Yeah. It's like after George Wallace lost the first time. Uh, it sounds like Dmitry Medvedev learned a lesson, and he's decided he's going to stick by I think that's uh, right. the party method. Stephen Hadley, again, uh, the handoff, it's a treasure trove for historians, for anybody that cares about these things in foreign policy. I'm so glad you put the project together. SMU, it's with the Bush Library? The book is a standalone. In yeah. addition, there's an online archive mm -hmm. that has the transition memos and all the voluminous attachments to them. So if you want to know about Bush foreign policy, get the book, consult the archive. There you go. Stephen Hadley, nice to see you. Thanks for having me. On the heels of Putin's announcement that Moscow was suspending participation in the only remaining nuclear arms control treaty between the world's two largest nuclear powers, in today's Being the Press Minute, we rewind to April 2010, shortly after that New START treaty was signed. Here's then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on the treaty's promise of protection for the United States and its allies. If this nuclear disarmament decision represents middle ground, is it enough to make the world safer? It certainly is. And, uh, I, I know that uh, uh, this is a, a very uh, important issue that I thank you for discussing with us because the president's uh, position is very clear. We will always protect the United States, our partners and allies around the world. Our nuclear deterrent will remain uh, secure, safe, and effective in doing so. But we also think we will ultimately be safer if we can introduce 
uh, the idea that the United States is willing to enter into arms treaties with Russia to reduce our respective nuclear arsenals, and that we're going to stand against nonproliferation in a way that will uh, perhaps deter others from acquiring nuclear weapons. And so you have to look at the entire package, nuclear posture review, the new START treaty, and the nuclear security summit. Welcome back. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg today announced he'll go to East Palestine, Ohio tomorrow. It will be his first visit to the town since that disastrous train derailment earlier this month. The National Transportation Safety Board is expected to release the findings of its preliminary investigation into what led to the derailment and the actions of the train company after. And today, former President Donald Trump made a campaign appearance of sorts, I guess, in East Palestine, toured a creek near the derailment site and visited a firehouse. He also received a briefing on the impact of the chemicals released by the derailment. East Palestine schools were closed ahead of Trump's visit, by the way. Jesse Kirsch joins me now from East Palestine, Ohio. So, Jesse, I saw there's some new statements from the CEO of Norfolk Southern blaming misinformation on and saying that that's holding back uh, cleanup. I mean, this looks like this is going to be a very contentious back and forth once we receive these preliminary findings from the uh, uh, safety board. Yeah, there's a lot of finger pointing going on. This is becoming a political football, Chuck. And at the heart of it are thousands of people who aren't sure of their own health and their livelihoods here because they're worried about the contamination in this community. They're also worried about the stigma, even if there is, in fact, not any contamination lingering. There's the question of if people will still want to work here and, 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 and come to this community uh, to spend time here. And that's something that I just heard from uh, a man a short time ago. He's a business owner. He's currently building a facility that he's hoping is going to be rented out for businesses for storage here and something that he thought would be able to be rented immediately is now something uh, that he, he may think he, he thinks he may have to sit on for a little while. So these are the kinds of concerns people have on top of the worries about their health after we saw that toxic plume go up in the sky here nearly three full weeks ago. Tomorrow we're going to get the NTSB's preliminary report. That's what the National Transportation Safety Board says. And so we'll be looking for any explanation as to why this train derailed nearly three weeks ago. So those are questions that are out there. You have the EPA claiming that it is going to make sure that the Norfolk Southern Railroad pays for the damage done here, pays mm -hmm. for the cleanup, pays for reimbursements for cleaning that the EPA does. But you also have residents skeptical as to whether or not that accountability will actually yeah. be seen if politicians are involved. That's something that we've heard from residents here. And we're going to see uh, something interesting tonight. We're expecting to see an appearance at a town hall with both the EPA administrator and uh, the CEO from Norfolk Southern. So it's going to be interesting to see those two on stage together, uh, potentially, and, you know, how they both posture in this. But right. the railroad, for its part, has made clear it says it's working with government officials and says that it will be cleaning up and that it is not packing up and leaving town tomorrow. They say they're here for the long haul to try to do right by this community. You know, I saw these trust issues. I thought it was interesting that Governor DeWine and, and, and the administrator from the EPA, Michael Reagan, went house to house almost testing water. Is that what it's going to take to try to build trust in this community that seems skeptical, even if the experts say, hey, your water's fine. Here, we'll drink it. Well, mind you, even though that's going on, you also have people who get their water from wells being told until final testing is finished, they should be drinking bottled water. We know more bottled water continues to be coming in here, including with help from the former president who visited today. So you have all that playing out. Uh, and the governor just put out uh, an update. Governor DeWine of Ohio just put out another update saying that there is still a portion of contaminated waterways mm. that is dammed off. So these are the visuals people are seeing in this community. And there's certainly still skepticism out here about what people are expecting in the days, weeks, months, and certainly years to come because there are people, I can tell you, who yeah. do not think that if the air and water is testing clean right now, that doesn't mean that it will down the road necessarily. No, and it, like a perfect storm of skepticism on corporate America, governments, local, state, national, all converging uh, on East Palestine. Jesse Kurz on the ground for us in East Palestine. Jesse, thank you. Still ahead, some help for Democrats as they brace for a potentially brutal 2024 Senate map. They get one of their embattled incumbents to say yes. This is Meet the Press Now.
Welcome back. We have some 2024 election news to get through. Montana Senator John Tester announced today that he'll be seeking re-election in 2024. Tester, first elected in 2006, has survived multiple elections in the Republican-leaning state. That's good news for Democrats who didn't really have a plan B if Tester had said no. They need to defend quite a few seats if they want to hold on to their slim Senate majority in 2024. I've got a great panel actually to talk to Senate if we want to spend the whole time doing it. Joining me now is our panel, Eugene Daniels, political White House correspondent, NBC News political contributor, senior advisor at the Strategic Victory Fund, Stephanie Shriot, and Republican strategist Brad Todd. See what I mean? We could really do some <laughs> Senate races there. But the tester news... Um, more like a sense of relief to Democrats than excitement, right? Mm -hmm. You hear a collective sigh mm -hmm. throughout um, Washington, D.C. and around the country for Democrats. Because you say they didn't have a plan B, they didn't have a C, a D, <laughs> a E in that state yeah. in particular. Oh, I, saw somebody go I saw somebody Googling Brian Schweitzer. Are we going to, we're going to the Montana? Yeah, 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 exactly. I saw somebody Googling Brian already. Schweitzer today and I thought, what happened to that guy? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's going to be a rough, yeah. it is going to be a rough Senate map for Democrats yeah. in 2024. And so they're trying to hold on to the, the incumbents as much as they can. And in these states like Montana, states like West Virginia, the, right. those kind of Republican-leaning states, that is where they need to make sure they keep those incumbents. Well, you managed that 06 race, I right? Did. Yeah. So somebody knows I a little did. something about it. I did. Let me ask and you this. I, and I talked to the big man today. I, it, He's I, feeling good. I was good. just going to say, you, so you had convinced me a while ago that you thought he was more likely to run than not run, that he's too competitive to walk away. A little competitive. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Um, that's true. He also loves his state. This is the, he is, we've met every Montana yeah. in town. We love our state <laughs> you know, so, so much. You know, so much. If I were to say the di biggest difference between Manchin and Tester, and I'll be curious what Brad's take is on this in a minute, I know, is Manchin will go out of his way to make sure you, he knows he'll criticize the Democrats. Tester doesn't do that. Do you think he needs to do it more? To survive? No, I need, Tester needs to be Tester. That, is, mm -hmm. that has always been the case. Mm -hmm. we, he is, so I described it in 2006, and it hasn't changed one bit. That's the other thing. It hasn't changed one bit. The guy is the same guy as he was then. He's the guy we all grew up with in Montana. That's mm -hmm. why he's popular. That's why everybody likes him. He just says it like it is. Mm -hmm. He gets along with everybody. He try, you know, tries to work with everybody. But he loves Montana, and the Montanans love him. So you said the Democrats are relieved. I got to say, a lot of people in Montana, the Montanans are relieved mm -hmm. that he's running again. Brad, why do you think Republicans have struggled to defeat him in the past? Well, you know, he has a conservative haircut and a liberal voting record. <laughs> and it's... Uh, I knew he had something. It, That's it, pretty it, good. It, I, in I 2018... Missing three fingers, too. It, it, it's 2018. <laughs> we've heard. we heard. Uh, in 2018, the best Democratic year in our lives, he gets 50% on the dot. And he also had the advantage... First time he'd ever gotten to 50. Uh, and, yes. The, but but, but, but Mitch, McC there. Mitch McConnell's yeah. leadership pack didn't show up on the air till October 23rd. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen this time. Mitch McConnell's pack got outspent two to one. That's not going to happen You're a weird time. primary, though. It's not going to happen. Republicans have to have the Senate. The nominee, whoever he is, will have a lot more support. I don't think McConnell will make that mistake again. It was a mistake, and I don't think he'll do it again. Uh, I want to pivot to a little presidential politics. I want to play a little something from Mike Pence today. Somebody decided to zag, while just about every other Republican these days on Social Security is zigging. Take a listen. When you look at the 22 election cycle, it's, it's an affirmation that elections are about the future. Our candidates that were focused on the past particularly on relitigating the last election, did not do well, including in areas that we should have done very well. Did you say we need someone else in 2024? You're on record saying that. I've right? said we, I think we're going to have better choices. I really Donald, do. Than uh, former President Trump. I, I think we're going to have I'm better throw choices. Out some, so well, it was not the clip I meant to play. The clip I meant to play was him deciding, Brad, that he's going, he's not afraid of touching Medicare and Social Security. And he is saying, hey, these need to be reformed. Don't run away from it. Well, I think, you know, Vice President Pence is looking for his lane, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's drafting in a crowded field, and he's looking for, he's looking for a slicker part of the track. Uh, and so I think he's probably trying to revive the Ryan wing of the Republican Party, sort of the green eye shade wing that's, that, that worships at the altar of balanced budgets and not a, not a policy side. And I, I don't think it'll work. I think realignment has moved past that. Uh, I don't the Republican think Party, there's not a... There's not a there's I, not a voting electorate for this. I don't think there's a voting electorate that has a zeal for entitlement reform mm -hmm. because they sense the political impossibility of it. There's a, there's a zeal for deficit, reducing deficits right. and reducing debt, but I think that voters have become pragmatic, right? I mean, that's why Democrats who are very liberal are clinging to Joe Biden. It's why yeah. Republicans are moving away from Donald Trump because they're pragmatic. Yeah. And so I, I think that they're sensing that entitlement reform is not going to happen, especially in divided government town. I don't think there'll be a market for it. Eugene, I think it's been interesting to watch Pence. He, he does feel like, well, all right. 
I'm going to run the race that I want to run. Mm -hmm. He's also, uh, he's not shying away from being involved in the administration that overturned Roe v. Wade. He's embracing it more so than Donald Trump is. No, he is. He and, and, and he is going to, and I've talked to some aides of his, former aides of his, what they say is he's going to have to do things he is completely uncomfortable with if he wants any chance in this nomination. What does that look nomination. like? What do you mean by that? Um, by how he just kind of tapped at Donald Trump, people who um, look at, talk about the old old races and not looking forward, they, they're saying, no, you have to say his name. You have to say, the guy that I worked with, I liked what we did in, in, in those four years, but now we're looking forward. And that's something that he seems completely uncomfortable doing, but I think if he's going to pop out, a lot of these folks who worked, Nikki Haley's in that same boat, Mike Pompeo, anyone who worked under Donald Trump, they're going to have to figure out how to differentiate themselves other than picking entitlement reform. They're going to have to go right at Donald Trump. You know, well, obviously you'd love to see Mike Pence as the Republican nominee because it would give Democrats two easy issues to hit him with, would it not? Abortion rights and um, entitlements? Yes, it would. But I still think even though you see some Donald Trump mm -hmm. slippage in the polls, all these people are going to jump in and here we go again. We've been to this rodeo. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump swings and he swings hard. And, and just was said, you got to swing back. And I'm just not seeing these Republicans willing to swing back at him. I just, I don't see it. And then we're going to end up with mm -hmm. the winner take all races through these primary season. You're going to see Trump in the lead really quickly. Brett, I was mildly surprised to see, I thought it was a bit risky for Trump to go to East Palestine because it his presence there is only as a campaigner. And that just seemed like a risky thing to look like you're doing. Well, it's a part of the country and, 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 a, and a demographic that's pretty key to his coalition. So I think he's going there to for brand protection. That I get. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, but it, it is a little risky, is it not? Looking yeah, like for sure. But he's, a, but he's a riverboat gambler in politics, right? Yeah. And he's lived through a lot of gambles that didn't work out. Oh. And so, uh, but I, I think to your to your point, the, the the fact about winner take all by state and winner take all by congressional district, that's that's Donald Trump's best strategy right now. Is the fact that the Republican primary gives a lot of its delegates to people who have a plurality that's not anywhere close to 50, and it's not proportional. Uh, I, however, I do think that a lot of Republicans, you're going to see a lot of Republicans who, who were with Donald Trump because they thought he was going to win, mm -hmm. now not be with Donald Trump because they're, they don't think he can win. This and, is pragma and the same they, pragmatism yes, that exactly. got them there will take them away. Exactly. But one, of the, but one of the things that when I talk to Republican strategists who are hoping that Donald Trump is not the nominee that they keep telling me is that they, everyone knows, every Republican knows and has not learned the lesson of one-on-one -on -one with Donald Trump is best, right? They have to get around a room, pick is somebody it, and move on. Well, is it though? Like, what's the proof of that there's, there's, I mean, there, I there's no proof of the opposite, yeah. right? Because well, you, have, you have his 34, 40 percent that's not going anywhere every single time they go to one of these states. And all of these Republican um, candidates, these, these strategists say, think they're the person, that they should be the person, but then you end up, if you end up with an eight, nine person mm -hmm. um, team or a, yeah. um, stage, that is rough for Republicans. Mm -hmm. This is them, not me. All right, Joe Manchin doesn't put away this idea that he might run for president on some other unity ticket, independent, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think, I'm guessing there's deep skepticism at this table that in our polarized climate that anybody can split the middle. What do you make of Manchin's flirtation? Well, I think it's good for his politics in West Virginia, you know, and mm -hmm. I think I'm hoping it's a good sign. I think it's a primary side. Maybe it may be a little bit. A, a, a how do I hold this yeah. this seat in West Virginia? What do I need to do to make sure I don't look aligned with the party? And I mean, I talk about Montana being Republican. I mean, West Virginia is a whole different right. level of Republican. Now, Manchin also was governor. Yeah. He's he really knows that state inside and out. So I would think of it just more of a general Manchin I, political strategy to survive in West Virginia. <laughs> right. I had some. It does feel like that. I had somebody say, how is he going to be able to run for president when he basically is the author of the president's signature legislative achievement? It's all theater. Uh, it, it, and, and Joe Manchin's good at theater, right? He, 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 he plays the independent and then eventually goes and toes the Democratic line. That's what I'll do again. All right. Brad, Stephanie, Eugene, thank you all. Up next, the story of a man convicted of murder and how the letter he sent to an NBC News producer sparked a 20-year investigation that's still ongoing. That producer and that former inmate join me next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. More than 20 years ago, an inmate at New York Sing Sing Correctional Facility sent a letter to Dateline producer Dan Slepian. 
The inmate, J.J. Velasquez, said he had been convicted of killing a police officer three years earlier, but he maintained his innocence, and he wanted Slepian's help in proving it. Well, now the story of their effort to exonerate J.J. has been made into NBC News Studios' first original podcast, Letters from Sing Sing. It's a story that already is resonating with viewers. It's been number one on the Apple podcast charts since its release. Take a listen to some of J.J.'s first letter to Dan. I know I don't belong here. But I am a firm believer that everything that happens to us in life is for a purpose. In no way am I condoning the injustice that has occurred in my life, but this incarceration has given me the opportunity to observe the world from another perspective. Well, I'm joined now by both J.J. Velasquez and Dan Slepian. And J.J., I want to start with you. Um, what's it been like to relive all of this? Surreal in one word. Um, the reality is, 18 months ago, I had no idea where I'd be today. You know, uh, for 24 years, practically, all I knew was living in a cage, living in a way that doesn't define humanity properly. And coming out of that and having the opportunity to be home, although I'm not technically free, um, it's, it's everything that, you know, I've been waiting for all this time in terms of being able to reunite with my family, mm -hmm. in terms of just being able to make certain decisions in my life for myself, like your choices are very limited when you're incarcerated. Dan, what made you take this letter and say, I got to help this man? There was just something about JJ's letter that touched me. He's so smart. He, it was meticulous, his letter, and it just made me more curious to know about him. And what really that sparked, Chuck, was a 20-year journey into a very dark abyss for me into the criminal legal system. You know, this, there's a reason this podcast is seven episodes, mm -hmm. and, and that's because it's a how and why not only people are wrongfully convicted, but how and why it's so hard to get those convictions overturned, even in the face of very clear evidence of innocence yeah. to anybody who's willing to look at it. The most, I guess, the hardest part, and JJ, you mentioned something, you're not yet free in some ways. Here you have, I want to play the President of the United States has apologized to you. I want to note this here. Let's play this apology. First of all, on behalf of all society, I apologize for it. I mean, 23 years. Thank My you. God. I must have felt like some level of vindication, J.J., and at the same time, you're not, you're not fully exonerated yet. Right. Um, the reality is that was a moment that I was waiting for the entire 24 years of my incarceration. And, um, the re you know, like, getting that, that moment where the president is actually apologizing to me, I, I, I was waiting for a prosecutor to apologize to me. I never... Fathomed the president actually apologizing on behalf of society and it was very heartfelt very much appreciated But the reality is is that to get to the White House. I needed to get permission from parole You know, I'm on a curfew So it's it's crazy to have the president of the United States apologize to me, right? Yet I'm still living on parole under conditions that limit my freedom Dan, explain. Why is this the case? Why has this been so hard to get him fully exonerated? His sentence got commuted, but not exonerated. Right. It, 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 th th that's why, again, I'm sorry, that's why the podcast is seven episodes. There's no easy answer to that. Right. And the, the, the truth is, is that this, what J.J.'s story does is it elevates this issue beyond just J.J. What J.J. went through and is still going through is representative of tens of thousands, if not more, people who don't have their voices heard. Right. And J.J. Is, is, has this platform to be able to tell his story. And he's opened up his world to us. And I think it's going to educate a lot of people. And I think it's going to teach a lot of people about how damaged our system is, particularly when there is clear evidence of innocence. Well, let's talk about that damage, J.J. I mean, what's something you hope now that, look, you... you you're taking your story and you're going to uh, hopefully try to share it with enough people to make some change. What's a, what's a first change you'd like to see so that it doesn't happen to somebody else? Well, I don't know if it would be the first change, but the biggest change that we really need to look at is prosecutorial indifference, right? For prosecutors to be like 
the vanguards of justice. When the truth is in front of you and you realize that a mistake has been made, you have to accept that. You can't just be indifferent to the fact that an innocent person is languishing in prison. Yeah. And, if, and on top of it, I have two sons and a mother that was suffering the entire time. You know, so having prosecutors actually be, you know, like mm -hmm. the vanguards of justice to show integrity. When there's a mistake made, accept it, right. fix it, move on. And that actually, Chuck, that's actually something else that this podcast does, Letters from Sing Sing, is that it talks about the, the effect of incarceration, right. the collateral effect. I met JJ's kids when they were eight and five years old. Mm -hmm. They're now 28 and 25. Wow. And, you know, J.J. used to write me letters that he was concerned for his oldest son, and his oldest son ended up doing a few years in prison when he was in his early 20s. So we get really into the weeds of this. Dan, I'm just... You know, we talk about a lot of uh, misconduct by police officers, and we want police officers held accountable. We never hear about prosecutors being held accountable for misconduct. Um, is that just something that's just too hard to make happen? Frankly, I think that we don't hear about people in power generally in the criminal justice system being held accountable for a lot of things that happen. Like most prosecutors and most police, I believe, are good people who are yeah. doing all the, are in the job for all the right reasons. But when, you know, there's qualified immunity, there's laws that protect people in, you know, in, who are prosecutors and police for making certain decisions. And that, what you just asked about accountability, is the next step, yeah. step of this fight. No, it's the, big glaring, it's the big glaring missing piece here. Exactly. The lack right. of accountability on the prosecutorial side of things, anyway. And that's the point of this. I want people yeah. who are seeing, listening to this 20 years from yes. now to think about what you're doing now because it never goes away. Dan, you've devoted mo most of your professional life to this. J.J. Velasquez, uh, I don't think uh, there are enough apologies out there for what you went through. But thank you both thank for you, spending Chuck. a few minutes with me. Thanks for having us, Chuck. Uh, appreciate it. NBC News Now coverage will continue with Tom Costello, who's in for my friend Hallie Jackson, right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.